Hello and welcome to this section on genre and genre analysis. The notion of genre is probably familiar to you from your experience as a fan of Netflix or as a moviegoer. Different films belong to different genres, as you can see on this list here. So there are action movies, anime, because she watched, <laughs> I don't know what that one is, comedies, crime, and, uh, and others. Now, before we go to the movies or before we start watching a movie on Netflix, we always have some idea about the film we are about to see based on the genre that it belongs to. Now, these expectations include not just ideas about the kind of story the film will tell and the kinds of characters it will include, but also ideas about things like cinematography, lighting, location, special effects, and other filming techniques. So a movie on, uh, in the genre of um, sci-fi, for instance, you would expect lots of uh, special effects in it. At the same time, not all films fit neatly into genres. So we might go to a film called a scary movie and find that it is actually a comedy. Or we might expect a film like Brokeback Mountain whose poster portrays cowboys to be a western, only to find that it is also a love story. In fact, one thing that makes such films successful, well, I'm not sure about a scary movie, but uh, yeah, is that they creatively confound your expectations by, make, uh, by mixing different genres together. And newspaper articles, for example, uh, tend to favor particular kinds of uh, cohesive devices and referring expressions. Well, for cohesive devices and referring expression, I'm going to have a, a separate chapter. And they are structured in a conventional way with a summary of the main points in the beginning with the details coming later. In this part of a newspaper article, uh, it was published in Guardian, you can see the Led Zeppelin band, uh, they say, uh, Stairway to Heaven, which is the name of the song, not an actual stairway, and not partly stolen, court affirms. So this kind of headline is, I would say, broken uh, English sentence, but it is a conventional way of making headlines in newspapers, and people know that already, so they wouldn't say, oh, but this sentence is not grammatical. They know this is a headline and this is how it works. So this is the way genres make people get accustomed to, to the way they, they function. And then there is a um, tiny summary below, and then there is this picture of uh, two of them, um, Robert and Jimmy, uh, I guess. A letter to the editor also is an example of a genre. Letters to the editors <clears throat> occur in a particular setting, such as in newspapers, journals, and magazines. And they have distinctive and recognizable patterns of organization and structure, as you can see in this slide. So this is like a response to the editor of a journal. So when you submit an article for publication, there are reviewers, so they review your article, then they give you some feedback or comments. Then you might want to um, uh, address those points, so you send a letter to the editor, and this is common a common structure you would use. So editor's name, journal name, date, your name at the at the bottom. And these are typically fairly short, and they usually aim to comment or present a particular point of view. This is another one. Uh, it's a letter to the editor of a newspaper regarding one of the issues that. Uh, and they have seen in newspaper, so you can see the structure. There is a thesis statement, an argument is given, uh, some evidence is provided, and then there is a summing up part. <clears throat> the other examples of genres are news reports, business reports, parliamentary uh, speeches, um, weather reports, and each of these um, occurs in a particular setting. It's organized in a particular way and has a distinctive communicative purpose. So the notion of genre in, in discourse analysis, especially, goes beyond examining the conventional structures and features of different kinds of texts to asking what these structures and features 
can tell us about the people who use the text and what they are using them to do. Now, uh, in his book, uh, Analyzing Genre, Vijay Bhatia, uh, drawing on the work of John Swales, defines genre uh, as such here. <clears throat> so, a genre, I, well, I'm going to read it. Uh, I know it's rather long, but uh, it's very useful to know. So, a genre is recognizable communicative event characterized by a set of communicative purposes identified and mutually understood by members of the community in which it occurs. Most often, it is highly structured and conventionalized with constraints on allowable contributions in terms of their intent, positioning, form, and functional value. These constraints, however, are often exploited by expert members of the discourse community to achieve private intentions within the framework of the socially recognized purpose. Now, <clears throat> there are three important aspects of this definition which I have highlighted. And uh, firstly, the genres are not defined as types of texts, uh, but uh, as types of communicative events. Secondly, these events are characterized by constraints or conventions and structures on what can and cannot be done within them. And thirdly, that expert users or gatekeepers often exploit these constraints in creative and unexpected ways, just like a game of chess. Certain rule, let's say finite rule, finite rules, but indefinite um, types of playing. <clears throat> Now, let's get into uh, each of them in detail. So, um, it, it might not seem unusual to refer to spoken genres like conversations and debates as events. But when you think of written texts like newspaper articles or recipes or job application letters as events, it might sound strange. So, we are in many ways <clears throat> accustomed to thinking of texts as objects, especially written ones. But seeing them as events highlights the fact that all texts are basically instances of people doing things with other people or to other people. So a newspaper article, for example, is an instance of someone informing someone else about some recent event. And at the same time, it might be about forming someone's opinion about some recent event. A recipe is an instance of someone instructing another person how to prepare a dish. At the same time, it can be for promoting a kind of cutlery or some ingredients from a certain shop. And a job application letter is an instance of someone requesting that another person or company give them a job. But from the perspective of the company, it can be a means to weed out uh, unsuitable candidates. <clears throat> um, now, next point is conventions and constraints. So genres are about getting things done. The way they are structured and, and the kinds of features that they contain are largely determined by what people want to do with them. Now, the kinds of information I might include in, in a job application, for example, would be designed uh, uh, to convince a prospective employer that I am the right person for the job. So this information would probably not include my grandmother's recipe for chocolate brownies or, or my opinion about uh, coronavirus. Uh, genres then uh, come with some built-in constraints as to what kinds of things they can include and what kinds of things they cannot based on the activity they are trying to, uh, to accomplish. <clears throat> Now, about creativity, you might think that all these structures, all these rules and constraints, how about creativity in this sense? Well, it's not to say that all, let's say, job application letters or other genres, like poetry, like newspaper articles or recipes, are always exactly the same. You can see it in movies. There are hybrid uh, movies that, uh, uh, that show this. Sometimes there are... Um, let's say comedies, but mixed with some kind of thriller or action and different things. So the experts in, the, in these fields usually know how to bend the rules or defy conventions and push the boundaries of, of constraints. 
So as I said, it's just like a game of chess. There are certain rules. So you cannot, for example, move that piece uh, from this place A to B just like that. But then within all those rules, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of different moves that people can make to make it creative. Otherwise, all the um, chess games would be exactly the same. Now, this brings us to one of the most important notions in discourse and genre, which is about uh, the notion of discourse communities. Now, um, it is clear that uh, at the center of the concept of genre now is the idea of belonging. So we produce and use genres, not just in order to get things done, but also to show ourselves to be members of a particular group or, or to demonstrate that we are qualified to participate in particular activities such as conferences, such as meetings, such as publishing in, in journals. Now, genres are always associated with certain groups of people, let's say linguists, uh, or medical experts, that have certain common goals to talk about linguistics, to do research on how languages are learned, how they should be taught, and common ways of reaching these goals. So they can do that through publishing their research papers in, in newspapers or magazines or, or journals, let's say. <clears throat> so um, genres are always associated, as I said, with certain groups of people with certain common goals and common ways of reaching those goals, right? So now doctors, for example, use medical charts and prescriptions to do the, the work of curing people. Um, solicitors use contracts and legal briefs to, to defend people's rights. And as a student, you and your teachers use things like textbooks, handouts, PowerPoint presentations, and examinations to accomplish um, the tasks of uh, teaching and, and learning. Now, these different genres not only help the people in these groups get certain things done, they also help to define these groups and to keep out people who do not belong to them. Now, uh, John Swales, I mentioned earlier, is one of the most influential figures in this field of genre analysis. He calls these groups of people discourse communities. Now, in his book, Genre Analysis, he uh, describes a, a number of features that define discourse communities, among which are that they consist of uh, expert um, members um, whose job is to socialize new members into how things are done, and that members uh, have ways of regularly communicating with and providing feedback to one another, and that members tend to share a certain vocabulary or jargon. They have a certain terminology. Now, the two most important characteristics of discourse communities are uh, <clears throat> that members have common goals and common means of reaching those goals here. Now, these goals, um, common means of reaching those goals, that is by research and publishing it in, in journals, uh, for instance. Now, these goals uh, and, and the means of reaching them work to reinforce each other. Every time a member makes use of a particular genre, they not only move the group closer to the shared goals, but also validate these goals as worthy and legitimate and show themselves to be a, a worthy and legitimate member, member of the group. <clears throat> now, uh, but how do we know that how we can assign text to a specific genre? Well, this is a key issue. Um, how we assign a text to a genre category. So we draw on many aspects of language and context to do this. So we may consider the author or the speaker of the text. For example, um, uh, Edgar Allan Poe is best known for uh, his short stories and, and poems, and specifically the macabre and the morbid descriptions that he has in those books. So whenever you hear that name and someone gives you a book by uh, written by Edgar Allan Poe, you can guess that it might fall into the genre of that sense. <clears throat> Macabre, for instance. Now, we may also consider the purpose 
of text, the situation in which it occurs, um, and we may also be influenced by a pre-sequence to the text. For example, if someone says, once upon a time, it means that the rest would be like a story, right? Especially like a fairy tale thing. Now, other factors that might help us decide what genre the text is an instance of may include the content of the text, the level of formality of the text. So in an academic article, for instance, you cannot just use informal uh, language. And people say that it is best to avoid using also personal pronouns, I, for instance. And so this is the kind of register or, or style that, um, that people use. So some of these <clears throat> may be more important than others in helping um, us to decide what the genre category is that a text belongs to. Some may, be, may also be difficult to determine, such as the, the purpose of a text. But communicative purpose is an important criterion for deciding whether a text is an instance of a particular genre. That is, a text may be presented in an unusual way for that particular genre, but it still have the same communicative aim as other instances of the particular genre, like a movie, for instance. In some cases, the text might be considered a best example of uh, the specific uh, genre, let's say. Shopping lists, response to to letters of recommendation and, and company brochures, for example, may have more than a single communicative purpose. A book review may describe and evaluate a book, but may also promote the book. Book introductions, for, for example, also uh, <clears throat> uh, can be uh, used as uh, ways of promoting a book. Now, assigning a text to a genre category does not necessarily involve an exact match in terms of characteristics or properties. It involves the notion of sufficient similarity to have a relationship with other examples of the genre in the particular genre category.